the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association, in its outreach to the world, presents the Word of Faith broadcast. It is our prayer that the revelation knowledge and the power of God be manifest in your spirit, soul, and body during the next hour. Now, with the message of Christ for the renewing of your mind, evangelist Kenneth Copeland. Thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this broadcast. We thank you for the great privilege to declare the Lordship of Jesus to this vast television audience. We praise you for it. We bless your name for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been studying the subject of faith, and I'm going to give you during this session the formula for the application of of the God kind of faith. First of all, let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans. And I want us to read from the 10th chapter of Romans, beginning with the 6th verse. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? that is, to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now I want us to turn to the 11th chapter of Mark once again, and let's read beginning with the 22nd verse. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Now we have read from two places in the Word of God concerning the operation of faith or the word of faith which we preach. And the Apostle Paul says that faith that is of the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall bring Christ down from heaven? But what does it say? It says that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You'll notice in that account that the Apostle Paul places the speaking, the confession of Jesus as Lord, even before he does the believing in the heart. He puts the saying first. Now let's read again what Jesus said, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Jesus puts the saying first. And he says then, And believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. I want to spend a moment here in pointing out to you that the Bible says three times as much about saying it as it does about believing it. Jesus used the word say three times in this 23rd verse, and he only used believe once. Somebody said, well, how am I going to say it if I don't believe it? Brother, you say it, you'll believe it. Now, you see, the, the Bible, once again, is giving us a principle 
that the world has been backward in. So I want us to dig into this a little bit, and then I want to give you the, the application formula for the use of the God kind of faith, or how to apply your faith against the problem, against the mountain. How to put the faith against the subject that, or the need that's before us. The Word of God has been sent to straighten out our thinking. Now, first of all, let me say this uh, in the light of the Scripture that we've just got through reading. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Now, that's worded in such a way that we don't right off the hand recognize it, but when, let me explain it to you a little bit, and I'll show you the way we've been doing this. And I say we, I'm talking about the majority of Christians. The songs that we sing, all of them practically, have the idea written into them if I can get Jesus to come from where He is, here where I am, in His physical form, I maybe could get some results. For instance, I would like to place my hand in the nail-scarred hand. Well, now those are pretty words. They're nice words. They sing well but they won't do you any good. And this is saying here, you see, this is what I mean. We have to straighten out our thinking about the proper perspectives in order to get the results that we need to get. Now, some people are going to get a little bit hot at me and a little aggravated at me, but you just sit still a minute and God will heal you. <laughs> <laughs> These things come through a physical, natural viewpoint of the Word of God. And the Bible says these things are spiritually discerned. The five physical senses have a desire to sing songs of woe, to sing songs of care. For instance, one of these days it'll be worth it all when all of this toil is over, when all of this woe is over, when all of this care is over, and my tears are all gone. Brother, I want you to know it's worth it all right now. You can do something about the tears and the cares and the woes of life with the gospel of Jesus Christ by using your faith in this life. You don't have to wait till heaven for tears to be gone. Thank God he said, I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. You don't have to be just a beggar trudging through the heat and the cold. Some of that stuff is absolutely ridiculous and a lot of it was, was written to sell you. It worked. And we used to, when I was, uh, back before I got saved, I spent some time in, in the nightclub entertainment business. And <laughs> I, one thing we knew when I was singing hillbilly music several years ago, that if you could get them to cry, they'd pay you. If you could get them to woe loud and long, they'd pay you for it. Now, I'm just going to leave that lie right where it is. <laughs> and you, if that shoe fits, you put it on and wear it. Now listen to me. The Word has been sent to straighten out our thinking. It says that the righteousness which is of faith does not say, if I could just get Jesus down here, if I could just see Him, if I could just feel Him, if I could just this or just that or the other. What does it say? It says that the Word of faith which we preach is near you. It's right there in your mouth. Say it, and it'll come to pass. Say it with your mouth. It's there already. God has put it there. God has ordained that it is there. Jesus is in heaven. The Holy Spirit is here in the earth, and He has been commissioned of God to see to it that God's Word comes to pass. And when a believer speaks in faith, in the name of Jesus, it carries the same authority as if Jesus himself had spoken. No wonder he said, go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. And in my name, these signs shall follow those that believe. They shall cast out the devil. Praise the Lord. They shall. 
they shall cast out the devil. Jesus has given the church authority to do these things in his name. And our words spoken in his name carry his authority. Now with that thinking, with that kind of, of train of thought, with the word of God to straighten out our thinking, here is the application formula for the God kind of faith and for its use. Number one, say it. We've done quite a bit of talking about that, but I want you to realize that your faith will not work any above the level of the confession of your mouth. The Bible says in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, in fact, let's turn over there and read it. I want you to see this. Uh, I, I don't know why I read through this and didn't see it so many times for so long. But when I did see it, it absolutely turned my faith life around. From Hebrews, the fourth chapter, let's start reading with the 11th verse. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, or it is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the mara, and is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intent of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Let's hold fast to our profession. Let's don't hold fast to the problem. Let's hold fast to the profession of the answer to the problem. Let me tell you now what this means. I was praying over some uh, requests that had come into this ministry, and, and one person had written me a letter, and in that letter they made this statement. Brother Copeland, I can't seem to get hold of God with my problem. Only she put it this way, I can't seem to touch God with my problem. That's what it was. I can't touch God with my problem. Well, I had heard that many times. That is a, a cliche or a phrase that, that is especially among full gospel churches, and you hear it nearly all the time. We need to touch God with this problem. We need to get a hold of God. And I knew there was something wrong with that. It just didn't ring right when I read it in her letter. I had never really thought about it up until then. I'd said it myself and never really given it much thought. But when I read her letter, it didn't ring right in my spirit. And I, I, I couldn't let it alone. And I couldn't figure out exactly how to pray for her. So I, I got my Bible and I went in to prayer. And I said, Lord... How am I going to pray for this woman? Now, she has said here in this letter that she can't seem to touch you with the problem. What, what should I do now? And I began to think about this and meditate about it. And uh, the Lord impressed me with this. He said, that's not the problem. And I thought, you know it isn't. The problem is not touching God with that problem. And immediately, this fourth chapter of Hebrews came to my mind. And I thought, she's spending all her time trying to get God's attention with that problem. In other words, all she's handling is the problem. She's continuing with the problem. The problem's on, she has never stopped to think about the answer. She's still talking about that problem. She's presenting the problem to God, evidently, over and over and over and over again. Well, now right here, we just got through reading in the 13th verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The problem was already before him. All things are naked before God. I mean, brother, you can't hide anything from God. And this is one of God's children. This is a Christian. This woman is a believer. Jesus Christ is her Lord. 
Well, the Bible says that the eyes of God are open and the ears of God are open and His eyes are over the righteous and His ears are open unto their prayers. So there's nothing wrong with God's sight nor His hearing. He's not so busy that He overlooked her nor her problem. The thing of it was, she kept bringing the problem to him and he already knew about it. So there's no place for her to go from there and there's really no place for God to go because he had already given her the answer in his word. The answer was already there. Now look what he said. Neither is there anything, all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with, with whom we have to do, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. She was holding fast to the problem. Well, now you know as well as I know, in that kind of situation, she's continuing to, to God, why, don't you know I'm sick? Can't you see this? Why don't you do something about this? I'm sick. Listen to her words. I'm sick. I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. She continues this confession of sickness over and over and over. And Jesus has given us the principle already and said we can have what we say in that, in that 23rd verse of the 11th chapter of Mark. And she's continuing over and over, holding on to a profession of sickness. There's no profession of faith in that unless it's faith in the sickness. See, that's what her confidence is. She's holding on to that. She keeps presenting it to God when all the time she has a great high priest who is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and the Bible has already said He bore her sicknesses and carried her diseases. Let us then hold fast to our profession, and that's what she was not doing. Come right on down then to the, the uh, 15th, 16th verse. The 16th verse says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that me may obtain mercy and find help in a time of need. It didn't say come there to present the problem. It said come there to get the help. You see, we've been so problem-centered that the only thing that we say with our mouths is the problem. And as long as nothing but the problem is coming out, I'll guarantee you you're chained to the problem. You're chained to it. I don't care who you are. The more you talk it, the more you think it. The more you think it, the more you dwell in it. God or anybody else couldn't get you out of it because you talk about it all the time. You spend all your time saying that. So what do we do? In the application formula of faith, we must hold fast to our profession. Your faith will never work any higher than your confession. Confession of the Word of God will bring possession of the answer. So I go to God with the answer instead of the problem. And that's what I wrote to her. That's what the Lord showed me that day, and I wrote that to her. I said, you don't need to present the problem to God. Present the answer. Go to the Bible and get the answer. It's His Word. He said, you know, uh, all over His Word from one end to the other, put me in remembrance of my Word. He said, concerning the works of my hands and my sons, command ye me. He's put himself on the spot with his word. So what do I do? I go to the word of God that gives it to me. I believe what the word says. And from that moment on, I begin to confess that I have it. I go before God with it. And I say, because your word says I have it, I believe I have it. It's mine. From now on in, I'm going to talk this word. I'm going to speak this word. I'm going to talk healing instead of sickness. I'm going, to talk, um, I'm going to talk wealth and happiness and health instead of poverty, lack, and nothing. I'm tired of nothing. Man, I, there, there's enough nothing people to go around. I'm tired of people talking to me about having nothing, doing nothing, wanting nothing, becoming nothing. If you'll notice the, 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 the mark of so many generations behind us has been all we want is just a small amount, thinking that's being humble, when all the time it was being ignorant of the Word of God, ignorant of what God had provided in His Word. And for some man, 
to stand up and think he's impressing God by saying, all I want in heaven is just a little log cabin. Brother, you're out of your mind. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And then for some dingling, say he wants a log cabin. <laughs> well, really and truly, he'd be lucky if he gets there. <laughs> Talking like that. Why? Why does he speak that way? Why does he talk that way? Because he talks from a level of his feelings and his feelings only. He isn't talking from a level of the Word of God. He's talking from the way he feels. And right then, in, he doesn't feel too hot. He feels kind of, you know, log cabin worth, <laughs> kind of. But I want you to know something, people. God has provided these things for us. Let's exercise our faith in them, in the name of Jesus. I, want the, I don't want the mansion that's coming to me. I want the mansion that God's provided for me. Thank God there wasn't anything coming to me. But he gave it to me anyway. I want the one he's given me, praise the Lord. Because the one he's given me is a way lot bigger than the one I've earned. Praise God. For we're saved by his grace through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Well, since that faith was a gift to me from him, praise the Lord, I'm going to use it. Thank God. And believe him for everything I possibly can. Now then. The next step in the formula of faith, number one is to say it. Guard over your confession. Guard the confession of your mouth, man. Say the word of God. Say in favor of you and in favor of God and in favor of the word. <laughs> that reminds me of something I saw the other day. I was in a restaurant and somebody had put a little card on the table and said, we hope that we have been of service in some small way. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, there's so much of the stuff that we do that's just absolutely stupid. I've had all of the small service I can stand. And they were right. They had been a service in a very small way. <laughs> really? You know, that's it. And somebody thinking he's being humble would say, I hope I've helped you in some small way. Well, if you're just going to help me in some small way, forget about it. I'll do it myself. Now, we've kind of carried that thing over into the way we believe. We've carried that over into, you know, into, into our faith. If I can be of service to God in just some small way. Well, brother, he's had all your little ways I imagine he wants. I want to be of service to God in a big way. I want everything I've got going in that direction. I don't like to do things in a little way. Let's do it, man. If we're going to do it, let's go all out for the thing. Now, the second thing, the second step is to do it. Step number one was to say it. But then you haven't done anything until you put what you said into action. Now, James said it this way. He said, faith without works is dead. One translation says, faith without corresponding action is dead and will not produce. He said, you show me a man that's got faith and I'll show you a man that will do what he believes. Now, let me illustrate this to you. I uh, hurt myself a couple of years ago. I was out playing with some of the kids. I had a couple of days off, and, and we went to my wife's folks, and all the kids were there, and all of her brothers and sisters, and she's the oldest of seven, and some of them had kids, and our kids were there, and I was out playing with the kids. Now, I probably should have been in the house with the old folk, but I, I don't like that. So I, and I, I hurt my neck, and uh, it got stiff, really stiffened up on me to where I, I could hardly move. I went in to pray about it, and uh, just before I went to bed that night, my neck was really hurting me by the time, time to go to bed, and I was just, you know, really stiffened up, cricked up, and that thing was paining me. And I had my, my heating pad all out on the bed and had it all plugged in and warmed up. And I had the rubbing goop, you know, on, that I was going to put on there. And my wife was all set to rub me down. And boy, that looked good. Man, I, that was the most inviting thing that I'd seen. Boy, my old back was hurting me and it was sore and it was stiff, you know. And I thought, man, I remember the times after, after playing ball. I was playing a lot of football. And I, 
and you get all beat up and jammed up, and how good that liniment felt when I'd get home and my mother would rub me down. My old bones would be hurting me, and I'd stand in there looking at that heating pad, and I, boy, I just could hardly wait till I got in bed with that, that warm pad be on my neck. Well, I reached over to get hold of the light to turn this switch off. You remember, those of you that were in the session where we read about the little woman with the issue of blood, for she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I should be whole. Well, right then, I said it. I said, Lord, I believe it in my heart, and I'm saying it with my mouth. Now, I'm saying it right here and now, and I believe what I say will come to pass. Jesus said, Whosoever shall say unto that mountain, Be thou removed, and not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. See, he's saying something that has not yet come to pass. And I said, I'm saying it in the name of Jesus. I believe it in my heart, and I'm saying it with my mouth. And I said it out loud. I said, the minute that I pull that light string, I believe that I receive the healing for my neck. That's when I believe it. That's my moment, and I'm saying it in Jesus' name. And I reached up to get a hold of the light, and I pulled it, and when I pulled it, I said, praise God, that did it, amen, it's done. That's what amen means is so be it. It doesn't mean the end. <laughs> most, people, most people pray, you know, and, and, and tag amen on there as the end, but that's not what it means. The word amen means so be it. That settles it. That does it. That's what that word's used for. I said, amen, so be it, that does it. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I'm saying it. See there? I'm saying it. I've got it. I'm saying it. I pulled the light string. And I started to get in the bed. There was my beautiful heating pad, <laughs> my beautiful heat rub. And these words flashed across my thinking. Healed, men. Don't sleep on heating pads. <laughs> oh, now I'm going to have to do it. I said it, and now and my neck is hurting me just as bad as it ever was. Now, here's where most people lose the battle. It's right here. I felt bad. I wanted that heat, man. But how much do you want your healing? Will you dare believe it strong enough to act on it? I said, praise God. And then I said that out loud. I said, heal men, don't sleep on heat and pads, and praise the Lord, I'm healed. I threw the thing out on the floor and turned around there like that and fell over into the bed because I was so stiff I couldn't move any other way. So I lay there on my back a minute, and I said, Lord, I want you to know I believe it. When I pull that light string, thank God I'm healed. That's when I believe or receive. Now, I didn't say I was healed because I felt like it if I had been lying about it because I was hurting. I didn't say I was healed because I looked like it if I had been lying about it. I said I was healed because the Bible says by his stripes you were healed. That's the only reason I was saying it. And because Jesus said I could have what I say. Well, now really, if you look at what I'm doing, I'm presenting God his word. I'm putting his word on the spot. Isn't that right? For him just to sit by and let that go on and not come to pass, make God out a liar. And I'll guarantee you nobody's going to make God out a liar if he has to split the Red Sea to see to it. <laughs> And I believe him for it. Praise the Lord. So I was laying there, and uh, I got this. Man, I know where I got it to. The devil's his name. He said, uh, why don't you roll over and see if you're healed? All right, now listen to it. We got him right where we want him. He is the God of the natural, physical world. The Bible said so. He's the God of the world of lust. He, therefore, is chained to that world. He's chained to the looking world, the seeing world, the feeling world, the hearing world, and the tasting world. When he gets you over into the world of why don't you look, why don't you see, why don't you feel, doesn't look to me like you got it. Doesn't look to me like you're going to get it. Why don't you feel and see if you're healed? 
If he pulls you over into that seeing and feeling world, he's got you right where he wants you and he'll whip you every time. He's the God of that world and I'll guarantee you he'll control you there. But if you keep him over in the world of faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. You keep him over in the arena of faith and I'll guarantee you through the name of Jesus, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus' intercessory ministry, the power of the ever-living God, I'll guarantee you'll whip him every time. You will take him hands down because Jesus has already defeated him. And right then, I hollered it out with my mouth. You might say, well, now, 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 preacher, now what if somebody else heard you? Well, I don't care somebody else heard me. At my neck was hurting me. That's the reason I don't care. Listen, I didn't care what they thought of me when I was drunk. I sure don't care what they think of me now that I'm right and I'm going toward God instead of away from him. Why, my, no. So I said out loud, no, I don't have to roll over and see if God's word's true. I said I'm healed and that's the end of that. And I refused to, oh, I wanted to roll over so bad I could hardly stand it. I wanted to so bad, but I wouldn't do it. Just laid right still. And finally, finally dozed off almost to sleep and I moved before I realized it. And when I did, I noticed it. It was gone. No more trouble with it. Free, clear, didn't have any more problem. It works. Say it, then put action to it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Now I want to show it to you from the Word of God. I want you to open from, to the uh, book of Romans and let's, let's turn there to the fourth chapter. The Bible calls Abraham the father of faith. The Bible uses Abraham as an example of faith. So if we want to operate in faith according to God, we ought to do it the way Abraham did it. Now from the fourth chapter of Romans, the Bible said, beginning with the 16th verse, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed or that the promise would come to pass not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. Now let's look at the 19th verse. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, and he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. God gets no glory when you're put under by sickness and defeated. It's when you're strong in faith. That's what gives God the glory. Praise the Lord. Now, he did not stagger at the promise of God. Now, notice this. I do not stagger at God's word giving me healing for my body. A lot of people stagger over that and say, how could that be? Well, man, I don't know how it could be. I just know it is. I don't stagger at that promise. I believe it, even though it does look unreasonable to the natural mind. But you know what? If you stop and think about it a minute, if you were a man unrelated to sickness at all, you never knew sickness, you didn't know it was in the world, you didn't know it existed, and all of a sudden, here's a man in good health, a strong, healthy, normal, hard-working, honest, clean, good-living human being, walking, going on about his own business, and within a matter of less than 10 days, he becomes eaten from the inside out by a disease that nobody can control called cancer and it kills him in a matter of days. He's, uh, he's rotted and gone away. That's as unreasonable as anything I ever saw in my life. Yet it happens. If you were not acquainted with sickness, that would look just as unreasonable to you as God's ability to heal that cancer. Isn't that right? I mean, that's the most unnatural thing in the world for a man just to take sick and die all of a sudden when there's nothing apparently wrong with him at all. It's a devil's miracle is what it is, and you know it is. 
Well, thank God my God's more powerful than he is. And he's got some tricks up his sleeve that the devil ain't never heard of yet. He knows his business and he's good at it. And you're his reason for doing it. So you see, I don't stagger at the promise of God. I believe it. Now look what he said. How did he believe that? He stated there that he believed it by considering not his own body. He considered not his own body. He was a hundred years old. God promised the man he'd have children. And it said he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Look what he's saying. What would be the first thing that would come to your mind if somebody said, uh, you know, uh, you and your wife are going to have a child? And you're a you're hundred and she's better than ninety. Who, me? <laughs> well, look at this old body. I mean, look at this wrangled up old hand. <laughs> look at this old man. Who, me? If nothing else, look at that old grandma. <laughs> How in the world is she ever going to have a child? Well, that's not what he said. He said he staggered not at the promise of God. What did he do? He considered not his own body. He would not consider what he felt, what he saw, what he tasted, and so forth. He would consider not his own physical senses. And he only considered that which God had promised. And he said, look, old man, you don't count. And then he said, look, old woman, you don't count either. The only thing that counts is the fact that God said we would have a child, and we're going to have it. We're going to have that child. Not only that, he said he was persuaded that God was able also to perform it. He's persuaded that God was able to do this. He was persuaded that God was able to perform it. So what did he do? He considered not his own body. He said it. He said God's able to do it and we'll have the child. He told everybody he was. Don't you know they said he's crazy? Listen to that old man. The old senile old man, he's going around saying he's the father of many nations, going around saying he's the child of God and the father of many nations, and he's 100 years old and doesn't have any kids. Who does he think he is? And then he comes out and says, we're going to have one. Now I know he's lost his mind. <laughs> old man's crazy. He socially flipped his lid. If he didn't have so much money, we'd put him away. But you see, he was God's man, and he owned two-thirds of the world. <laughs> Yes, sir, you can't find old Abraham going for that poverty stroke, man. He does, uh, none of his descendants do either. Thank God for it. Well, you never found an Israelite in your life that believed in poverty, did you? I never did. You can't find that poverty business over in the Old Testament. Somebody dreamed that up a long time since then. It's not in the Word of God. Praise the Lord for it. He said, that, he said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Beloved, I would that you prospered, be in good health even as your soul prospers. That's God's idea of life, man. If God was in love with that poverty business, there wouldn't have been a leaf on any tree in the Garden of Eden. Nothing there. Absolutely would have been the most barren, run down, beat up looking place you ever saw because God planted that thing and he gave it to old Adam free of charge. I mean, he set him in there to live, didn't he? All right, what was it? The most magnificent place the world has ever known. Absolutely everything the man could dream of to take care of him, God gave it to him. That's God's idea of life. If it wasn't, he wouldn't live in such splendor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What am I saying to you? Abraham believed God. He said it with his mouth, we'll have this child. I consider not my own body, nor the deadness of my wife's body. I am persuaded that God's able to perform it. Then what did he do? He acted on that. Even after the boy was born, he acted on the fact that he believed he was the father of many nations. And when God called for him to make sacrifice of that son, he took Isaac up on top of a hill and he laid him on an altar and raised the knife to take his life. And the book of Hebrews said that he did so knowing that God would be obligated to raise him from the dead. 
because he had God's word for it. He wasn't no more afraid about killing that boy than nothing in the world. He was going to get to see God raise him from the dead. I mean, he's a little bit disappointed uh, uh, the way the thing came out. That's the way the Bible reads. He acted on that faith. He acted on the fact that he believed it. So step number one was say it. Step number two was do it. The little woman with the issue of blood said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, but then she had to go get hold of the garment, and she did it. She fought her way through that crowd, evidently on her hands and knees, and caught hold of that garment, and she was made whole. She could have sat up there in her <laughs> apartment, you know, back over there out of the way, spent everything she had. The Bible said so. She spent everything she had. She's broke, living in a cold water flat on the back side of town. And, and, and said, if I could just get a hold of God, if I could just get a hold of Jesus, if I could just get a hold of this garment, I'd be made whole. But he don't know me. He doesn't care nothing about me. He doesn't know where I am. He doesn't know where I live. And I'm so poor. I'm so weak. And I'm so unworthy. I'm so no good. I, 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 could, I could never get into that crowd while they're liable to step on me. Somebody like that needs stepping on One, one woman, one, one place used to get up and testify and say, I'm just a night crawler. I'm just a... As some of you folks in the television audience may not know what a night crawler is, but us Texas folks do. It's a big old green worm about that long that you use to go catfishing with. She'd stand up and say, I'm just a night crawler. I'm just an old night crawler for Jesus. And one fella got all of it he could stand. He got up and said, yeah, and one of these days the devil's going to go fishing with you. <laughs> That kind of unbelief will absolutely destroy faith. It'll get rid of it. It may sound good to you, brother, but it's absolute torture to the ears of God or to anybody else that believes and has any kind of faith working in them. All right. The little woman with the issue of blood did what she said. She went out, caught hold of the hem of that garment, even though she had to crawl to get there. She put out what it took to get it done. The third step, we've said it, we do it, now we receive it. Receive it. I want you to learn to prepare to succeed. Stop preparing to fail. Cut what if out of your vocabulary. The most dangerous words to the Christian is, yeah, but what if? The worst two words in your language is, yeah, but. Every time we start to pray, I have people that have come up to me and say, Brother Copeland, I have this terrible problem, and, and this is it, and they go through all of that, and, and, uh, and, and what are we going to do? <laughs> I want you to pray, and we'll start to pray, and I'll say, well, now the Bible says about this particular thing, and, and say, so yeah, but. And right after that, yeah, but, you know, they're fixing to get rid of everything that faith had anything to do with. Yeah, but you don't understand my circumstances. Yeah, but you don't understand what they did to me. Yeah, but you don't know how bad I hurt, brother. <laughs> you know, and you say, well, now the Bible says by his stripes we were healed. Yeah, but you don't know what all happened to me. But yeah, but what if? One lady said, Brother Copeland, what do you do when you're witnessing to somebody and you go in their home and there's sick people in there? I said, you go lay your hands on them. Pray for them. Jesus said these signs will follow the believer. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Yeah, but... Is that... <laughs> there it is. See, yeah, but... Yeah, but... I... What if he doesn't heal them? Yeah, but what if? See, preparing for the failure instead of the success. I said, yeah, but what if he does? <laughs> yeah, but he might not. I said, well, in that case, then he's a liar. He's already said, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. That yeah, but what if is what's robbing you of that sign following you. See, it says those signs follow the believers, not the yeah, but what ifers. Uh, that's just exactly right. One man said, well, I'll tell you what, our church doesn't believe in healing. Well, don't worry about it. You'll never be bothered with it. <laughs> we don't believe it this way. That's fine. You'll never have it this way. 
Yeah, but what if? Take that yeah, but what if and get rid of it. Receive from God. Set yourself to receive from God. Put yourself in the position of receiving from God. Set yourself in the place to receive from God. I had God to, to make me aware of this only a few days ago. He said, what would you do if you had unlimited funds to evangelize the world? What's the first thing you would do? And I got to thinking about it. I don't know. There's a lot of things I would have to stop and figure out what to do. I would lose precious time. Why? I had never believed I received. I had never begun to receive unlimited funds from God to evangelize the world. So therefore, I would be behind if it came. I got on my knees and I prayed about it and I said, Lord, you'll have to forgive me for that. I, that's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. So I got the whole crew together, all of our crusade team, all of our office force, everybody, we all got together. We started praying and I asked each one of them that question. And each one of them had, after we prayed, they had a different thing that they would go do right then if we had that unlimited finance given to us. So I, when I, we got through, there was things all over the place. I found out there were a lot of things in there that we could now do that we were not doing. When you begin to receive, when you begin to set yourself to succeed instead of fail, you'll find out there's a whole lot of things you can do now. You don't have to wait until after the miracle's done. There's a bunch of things you can head down that direction now. And old lazy you and old lazy me wasn't doing it. And brother, we got our house in order. Got things going around there. Got people assigned to different jobs and different things that needed doing. Setting ourselves, getting ready for this great move of God that's in the earth today. And you know what the Lord said when we got through? Praise the Lord. He said, now you're ready. I'll send in the unlimited finance. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, I'm ready. Thank God. We're revamping this thing and watching over it every day. Praise the Lord. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for it. This television broadcast is part of it. The fact that we got ready for it. We believed for this. We prayed for this. This ministry never has borrowed a dime for anything and we never will. And we go to God, we pray for it, we believe that we receive it. We got all of it put on paper. We got it put down like we wanted it. Knew exactly what we were going to do, how we were going to do it. We, we had the thing all planned out. We didn't have a dollar. Not a dollar. But we believed that we received. We said it. I started saying it over a year ago. I'm going to put this ministry on television. Thank God I've got it. We've got the funds to do it. We've got the avenues to do it, the way to do it, the people to do it. I started saying it. Wasn't anybody in it but me. Didn't have any of the team then, none of the office force then. Didn't have any of the people that God has sent me that know how to do these things. But I just kept on saying it and, I, and, I, and talking about it and doing it. Every time somebody mentioned television, I'd jump right straight up. I'd go into a town somewhere to preach the gospel in a church. They'd say, would you like to be on television? I'd say, you just give me the address of that place, brother, and I, I want it on there. I, I, I was acting on what I believe. I told everybody, this ministry will, will be on television. And they said, oh. And I said, well, sure it will. And, and only a few weeks ago, some, some people hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles from us called us on the telephone in a meeting that we were conducting a long ways away from them. We hadn't seen them in months. They said, Brother Coburn, we've been having a prayer meeting and God dealt with us and we're sending some money to help put your ministry on television. And brother, within five days later, we were ready to go with the money in the bank. That's my God. But we had to prepare to succeed, not prepare for what if it doesn't come. It never would have come. We're talking about walking by faith, not walking by what we can see. Anybody can do that. Everybody in the world does that. I'm not about walking by faith. I'm talking about something that takes some effort to put it over. I'm talking about something that takes some effort to swing it. Big league ball players don't get big league in an hour's time. It takes work. It takes effort. And I'm talking about big league Christianity is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that takes more than a couple of days, you know, down to church a week. I'm talking about something that when a guy begins to produce the way I'm talking about, the kind of thing that I'm teaching you out of the Word of God, 
When a man begins to live that way, he begins to be somebody that his church can lean on instead of him all the time just leaning on his church. He begins to be somebody that when the church has got problems, he's the man they call because this guy's got something. He begins to be somebody that the men in his office know, that he knows something that they wish they had. And they, you know, they may put him down pretty strong during the week, but I'll tell you what, let their kids get sick and he's the man they call. Well, thank God for it. Don't put them down for it. Thank God for it because it works. Receive it. Prepare to receive it. If you're praying for healing, prepare to receive it. Prepare to receive it. Don't prepare to be sick. Come on in, sickness. I'll put silk pajamas on you. I'll put you in a, the finest mattress in the world. I'll feed you every kind of a pill I can get my hands on and I'll give you the very best specialist in the world. How long are you going to be with me this time? I've been expecting you. <laughs> I've even got my time laid up for you. Yes, sir, I've got five days to be sick this year. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to be sick. So what have we talked about? Prepare to succeed, not fail. Say it, do it, receive it, and then, brother, tell it. Testify to it. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. Testify to the things that God has done for you and testify to what you believe. Well, it's been a joy sharing that formula with you. I, 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 I want you to use it. It'll work. I used it on paper a long time before I had it memorized, and I'd set it up on my desk before I would pray, and, there, and I would do it. Say it, do it, receive it, and tell it. And I'd go through those areas, and it'll work for you. Praise the Lord. Well, it's time for us to pray. I've asked a man that's very closely associated with this ministry, a very good friend of mine, Brother Cal Habern, if he'll come and pray with me. And while we pray, I want all of you here in the studio audience and all of you in the television audience, if you have any kind of need, whatever that need may be, take it to God right now. Say it, do it, receive it, and then tell it. Praise the Lord. As we pray together, whatever it is, Jesus is the answer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the two of us lay hold upon your word and we pray for the needs of the people. We thank you for deliverance. Jesus, heal the people wherever they are in the sound of my voice. Heal the people wherever they may be. Set them free by the power of the word. Save them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Deliver them from the power of the devil and put them on the faith walk in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now I want us to lay hands on this globe and believe God for the great continuation of the revival. I, really, a word I like better than revival is crusade. Uh, there is revival among the Christian people right now all over this world in every denomination. But I like the word crusade, the, the move, boy, the push of the Word of God into the lives of men, setting them on their feet and getting them right and before God. So let's pray together for this world that we live in. My Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, heal this world. Spread the power of the gospel of Jesus throughout this globe in the name of the Lord, and we thank you for it. Heal it of its woes and its wars and its crime and its filth and its hunger. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. Praise the Lord. This has been a, an exciting time for me, televising these sessions on faith. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've enjoyed delivering it to you. I want you to know this. It will work if you'll act upon it. However, if you pass it off as just another television broadcast or just another little something you heard or just another religious talk, it won't do a thing in the world for you. In fact, you'd probably be better off had you not heard it. But if you will use it, if you will take hold of it, stand on it, act upon it, 
This could be the day of the beginning of your story, your testimony, your story of God's glory in the life of a, just a common man or just a housewife or just a young person in school. God is real. Jesus is Lord. Thank you. You have been witnessing the ministry of evangelist Kenneth Copeland. Address all correspondents to the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association, Post Office Box 3407, Fort Worth, Texas, zip code 76105. Remember, Jesus is Lord.